The Senate will come to order. Members, please stand for the prayer. Today's chaplain is our Senate chaplain, Pastor Mike Smith from Redeeming Love Church in Maplewood, Minnesota. And following the prayer, please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Good afternoon, Senators. Even though I haven't been with you in these past months, I haven't forgotten you, but I feel like I need to reintroduce myself. Um, and let me just briefly say, ever since the death of George Floyd, I, I felt in my heart to go to 38th in Chicago every day just to pray with people and give hope, and it's because I didn't know what else to do when our, our city's hurting. But I want you to know that in the middle of all of this, I've seen people come together, and, uh, and I am so encouraged. And with that in mind, let me pray. Lord, in these past days, as a community, we have known the pain. We've seen the grieving of hearts that have been deeply wounded by racism. And we've had a corporate cry for justice. We've all felt the sense of hopelessness and despair. At times, it seems, Lord, that our hearts have been ripped in two. And we know what it's like to have a broken heart. And as I pray this, Lord, as a white man, I cannot even understand the depth of pain that black families, men and women, are experiencing. But Lord, you know that. So Lord, Jesus taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He didn't say my Father, but he said our Father. He didn't say a white man's Father or a black man's Father. He said our Father. He didn't say the Democrat's father or Republican's father. He said, our father. So we come to you today knowing that you are our father. As Dr. Tony Evans, a black pastor, said, we're in the middle of a medical pandemic and now we're also in a cultural pandemic. But underneath it all, we are in a spiritual pandemic. We, as a nation, have gone away from our Father who loves us and has called us to love our neighbor. But you are our Father who saves. You are our Father who forgives. We know that you are our Father that heals the broken heart and sets captives free. And you're our Father who gives hope. And you're our Father who loves us unconditionally, even when we don't love you back. And Jesus also said, Lord, he said, God so loved the world. He so loved the world that he gave his son that whosoever, whosoever, whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So, Lord, through it all, we come to this place still having hope. We come to this place still with our hearts turn towards voices that can bring healing. Through it all, we come to you today with hearts of humility and repentance, hearts that are wanting to change. And you are our Father who allows us to reset. So we set aside reacting. We must set aside reacting with our emotions that are on edge and on the surface. We set aside our own agendas. We set aside our own will. Instead, we say, your kingdom come, your will be done, even in Minnesota, as it is in heaven. And Lord, instead of reacting as leaders of influence, we will respond with wisdom and unity. So my prayer is, Lord, may we come back to you. We cannot change our nation. We cannot change our cities or our state if we're unwilling to change our own heart. In recent days, Lord, we have shown the world. The world has seen. They've looked at us and they've seen what racial prejudice and injustice would look like. They've seen our destruction. But, Lord, I am convinced that as we in this moment turn to you, we have this opportunity to show the world what humility and repentance looks like. Lord, this is our day. This is our day in Minnesota to now show the world 
what reconciliation looks like, what true reformation looks like that comes from heaven. So I say, God bless Minnesota. I say, God bless the Twin Cities from 38th and Chicago to Summit Avenue, from Lake Street to University Avenue. And I pray that, God, you would bless these servant-hearted leaders I believe, I know as a pastor, as a friend, I believe in them, and I believe in the call that you have on their lives. We say, your kingdom come, yes. And we say, to thine be the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Yours is the government. We put this government in your hands. So I say, fill this great state of Minnesota with hope and healing once again and with true liberty and justice for all. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Members, the secretary will call the roll by legislative district. If you are in the chamber, after you hear your name, please respond by saying here. If you're present in an alternate location, the, your response will be recorded by the front desk. The secretary will call the roll. Senate district number one, Mark Johnson. Senate dis uh, district two, Paul Utke. District 3, Thomas Bach. District 4, Kent Eakin. District 5, Justin Eichhorn. District 6, David Tomasoni. District 7, Eric Simonson. District 8, Bill Ingerbretson. District 9, Paul Gazelka. District 10, Carrie Rood. District 11, Jason Rarick. District 12, Tori Westrom. District 13, Jeff Howe. District 14, Jerry Relf. District 15, Andrew Matthews. District 16, Gary Dames. District 17, Andrew Lang. District 18, Scott Newman. District 19, Nick Friends. District 20, Rich Draheim. District 21, Michael Goggin. District 22, Bill Weber. District 23, Julie Rosen. District 24, John Jasinski. District 25, David Senjum. District 26, Carla Nelson. District 27, Dan Sparks. District 28, Jeremy Miller. District 29, Bruce Anderson. District 30, Mary Kiffmeyer. District 31, Michelle Benson. District 32, Mark Coran. District 33, David Osmick. District 34, Warren Limmer. District 35, Jim Abler. District 36, John Hoffman. District 37, Jerry Newton. District 38, Roger Chamberlain. District 39, Karen, Karen Housley. District 40, Chris Eaton. District 41, Carolyn Lane. District 42, Jason Isaacson. District 43, Charles Weger. District 44, Paul Anderson. District 45, Ann Rest. District 46, Ron Latz. District 47, Scott Jensen. District 48, Steve Swazinski. District 49, Melissa Franzen. District 50, Melissa Wickland. District 51, Jim Carlson. District 52, Matt Klein. District 53, Susan Kent. District 54, Carla Bigham. Dis District 55, Eric Pratt. District 56, Dan Hall. District 57, Greg Clausen. District 58, Matt Little. District 59, Bobby Joe Champion. District 60, Carrie Dietzik. District 60, Scott Dibble. District 62, Jeff Hayden. District 63, Patricia Torres Ray. District 64, Richard Cohen. District 65, Sandra Pappas. 
District 66, John Marty. District 67, Fong Her. A quorum is present. We'll continue on the agenda with executive and official communications. Members at your desk uh, should be a copy of the governor's proclamation for special session. Yeah. Uh, the next order of business is the ninth order of business, motions and resolutions. The secretary will read Senate Resolution Number 1. Senators Gazelka and Kent introduce Senate Resolution Number 1, a Senate resolution relating to organization and operation of the Senate during this special session. Senator Gazelka. Mr. President, I move that Senate Resolution Number 1 be adopted. Discussion on that motion, Senator Gazelka. Uh, Mr. President, members, uh, Senate Resolution 1 is the organizing resolution for the special session and is identical to organizing resolutions for special sessions with the exception that the Finance Committee is established in addition to the Rules Committee. The temporary rules of the Senate as they were in effect at the end of regular session will apply to special session. Any other discussion? Members, this resolution does require a roll call vote. Is there any other discussion before we take the roll? Seeing none, the secretary will take the roll on Senate resolution number one. Members in the retiring room, in the retiring room, please come to the chamber to vote. Members in room 303, room 303, please make your way to the chamber to vote. Members in the president's office, please come to the chamber to vote. Members in room 323, room 323, please come to the chamber to vote. Members in room 237, room 237, please come to the chamber to vote. Members in room 206, room 206, please come to the chamber to vote.
I will now call on Senator Gazelka to report the votes of the members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Gazelka. Uh, uh, Senator Bruce Anderson votes aye. Senator Anderson B votes aye. Senator Gazelka. Senator Hall votes aye. Senator Hall votes aye. Senator Gazelka. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Gazelka. Senator Nelson votes aye. Senator Nelson votes aye. Senator Gazelka. Senator Senjum votes aye. Senator Senjum votes aye. I will now call on Senator Kent to report the votes of the members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. President. I report aye for Senator Carlson. Senator Carlson votes aye. Senator Kent. I report aye for Senator Eaton. Senator Eaton votes aye. Senator Kent. I report aye for Senator Frentz. Senator Frentz votes aye. Senator Kent. I report aye for Senator Isaacson. Senator Isaacson votes aye. Senator Kent. I report aye for Senator Klein. Senator Klein votes aye. Senator Kent. I report aye for Senator Lane. Senator Lane votes aye. Senator Kent. I report aye for Senator Newton. Senator Newton votes aye. Senator Kent. I report aye for Senator Pappas. Senator Pappas votes aye. Senator Kent. I report aye for Senator Rest. Senator Rest votes aye. Senator Kent. I report aye for Senator Sparks. Senator Sparks votes aye. Senator Kent. I report aye for Senator Wickland. Senator Wickland votes aye. And that Sen is my complete list. All members having voted who have the desire to vote, the Secretary will close the roll. There being 66 ayes and zero nays, the motion prevails and the resolution is adopted. The Secretary will read Senate Resolution Number 2. Senators Gazelka and Kent introduce Senate Resolution Number 2, a Senate resolution relating to notifying the House of Representatives and the Governor that the Senate is organized. Senator Gazelka. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that Senate Resolution Number 2 be adopted. On that motion, Senator Gazelka. Mr. President, uh, this resolution notifies the Governor and the House that we are duty, duly organized. Any further discussion on Senate Resolution Number 2? This resolution does not require a roll call. So we're on Senate Resolution Number 2. All those in favor, say aye. Opposed, say no. We will take a brief pause to gather the votes of the members in alternate location. Receiving a sufficient number of aye votes, the motion prevails and Senate Resolution Number 2 is adopted. The Secretary will read Senate Concurrent Resolution Number 1. Senator Gazelka introduces Senate Concurrent Resolution Number 1, a Senate Concurrent Resolution relating to Minnesota's peacetime emergency, terminating the peacetime emergency pursuant to the authority under Minnesota Statute Section 12.31, Subdivision 2, Paragraph B. Senator Gazelka. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that Senate Concurrent Resolution Number 1 be adopted. To that motion, Senator Gazelka. Mr. President, members, uh, this exercise is the legislator's authority to terminate the peacetime emergency declared by the governor on March 13, 2020. This resolution would become effective only after adoption by the House, following adoption by the Senate. After adoption by the Senate, it would be effective the day following the adoption by the House and would terminate the peacetime emergency and would have the effect of nullifying the authority for all orders based on that declaration. 
Discussion on Senate concurrent resolution number one. Senator Abler. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, it's interesting to be back. I uh, walked in outside and saw the, the chain link fence, and um, I thought that was kind of grievous. And I um, know that chain link fence represents a lot of deep concerns by a lot of people in Minnesota unrelated to this resolution, but I just wanted to mention that, that, that uh, we are all people together here, and we listen, and we care, and uh, I cannot wait for things to go back to whatever we thought normal was uh, with the COVID thing and with um, helping make sure everybody is respected at every level. Um, but I rise in support of this resolution. Uh, I did not support a motion like this a month ago, uh, I thought there was still need for some of the work to be done. There was uh, still the fear that uh, great spiking may happen. Uh, we were still uh, working on uh, handling our capacity at the ICUs, and, uh, and the, uh, the, the curve was flattened, and it should have been declared a success uh, today that we are well on track where Minnesota can handle this without all the powers that are necessary in the hands of one person. I have a great deal of respect for our governor. I reached out to him on many occasions to offer my advice and support to him on this matter, and sadly, we've never even had a conversation, which I, which I really regret. Um, but Mr. President and members, um, Minnesota is ready to reopen. We have had our attention gotten. We are, social distancing is now a term. People wear masks when they're concerned. Um, and so I'm gonna just uh, read an email that I got from one of my constituents uh, yesterday. And uh, this woman writes, she says, I'm involved in marketing of the merchants in downtown Anoka. I talk to them all the time. I hear their struggle to meet their expenses. Being creative is one thing, but limited, and not knowing the opening in Minnesota makes them nervous. Restaurants drive traffic to the shops and vice versa. So it's extremely important that everyone can open to ensure the survival of small businesses. As the legislature gathers for a special session this week, we urge you to fully reopen Minnesota's economy. While we appreciate the steps taken recently to further reopen Minnesota businesses, our state's small businesses cannot wait any longer. They are prepared and ready to fully open safely while protecting their employees and customers. And their employees want to get back to work. Thousands of Minnesota small businesses and their employees are counting on your support and leadership. Minnesota businesses are ready. Yerazima Garcia, a good friend of mine. So Mr. President, I could not say it more, more uh, concisely than my friend Ms. Garcia. But I also want to comment about the concerns that seem to be present about the number of deaths that are still occurring. And uh, like, holy cow, there's still so many cases. I think what matters really mostly are understanding the deaths. But Mr. President, I want to remind you that these deaths are occurring mostly in facilities. And if they're not in a facility, they're in, a, in the hands, in the, in the tragic death of someone who's already been sick. And in that area, this order has done nothing to save one life. Uh, the order has confounded things and has made the nursing homes and the assisted living places, uh, in my opinion, minimally safer, if any. Uh, and that's where their problems lie. And focusing on, they're going to continue to do extreme measures with the support of us. Uh, but these businesses who are already, or they're already relatively safe by comparison, uh, need to have a chance to, uh, to reopen. So, Mr. President, I urge members to vote yes. Thank you. Further discussion on Senate concurrent resolution number one, Senator Little. Thank you, Mr. President. Would Senator Gazelka yield for a question? Senator Gazelka will yield. <laughs> Senator Little. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, my first question is, um, would the effect of this resolution eliminate all existing executive orders? Senator Little, please, uh, please repeat your question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, my question is, would passage of this resolution in the Senate and the House eliminate the existing executive orders related to the peacetime emergency? Senator Gazelka. Mr. President, Senator Little, that is correct. We would go back to where we were, uh, in addition to the fact that the governor has about $2 billion of COVID money from the federal government that would completely work through the LAC, so it would go back to the way it was prior. 
Senator Little. Okay. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, will Senator Gazelka yield for just one more question? Senator Gazelka will yield. Senator Little. Thank you, Mr. President. I was listening earlier today to a news conference, and um, Senator Gazelka had mentioned that we will adjourn um, uh, the Friday following this one. Um, is, is that still um, uh, the case, Senator Gazelka? Senator Gazelka. Mr. President, Senator Little, that is correct. Uh, if we cannot come to an agreement within that period of time, uh, then we can just continue to work on things after. Uh, I also mentioned that if there was something that all legislators agreed needed to be done at a different date, uh, the governor can choose to call an additional special session. Senator Little. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I also want to thank Senator Gazelka for yielding to those two questions. I just have a, a statement to make after that. Um, you know, those two questions are really important for how I'm voting today and how I think a number of our members will vote today. Uh, my <clears throat> primary concern um, is that if there is a second wave, um, which some are expecting and we're seeing some evidence of that um, in other states that have fully reopened, um, the legislature is not in a position to come back and meet quickly to deal with those issues. Um, so I am definitely concerned with that, especially if we are going to adjourn uh, a week from today and not be able to uh, pass any legislation to deal with the second wave. The other primary concern I have is that uh, it eliminates the existing executive orders which are protecting a lot of people. Um, you know, namely, I believe it's uh, 2054, where there can be no discrimination against someone wearing a mask. Um, you can't retaliate against someone that feels they need to work from home. Um, so I'm, I'm incredibly worried uh, about the people uh, that feel they are at risk or know they are at risk, have an underlying health condition that's listed in the executive order, or as a senior that's worried that they're in that high-risk population, that they would be required to go back to work, um, and maybe in some cases um, they don't want people to wear PPE. Maybe that's not what the business wants to do. And I know most aren't going to do that, but there may be a situation that arises um, where someone is put at risk and that executive order is completely eliminated and people don't have protection. So they could potentially be fired just for trying to protect themselves and their family. Um, I know there's a number of other executive orders that are doing things to protect people as well, um, including a lot of the guidelines. Um, as you see from the graphs, we are trending downward in the, uh, the number of cases each day. And I think um, that's a good thing. Obviously, that is what we're working towards. And so if we're going to, if we're going to change this something, if we're going to uh, eliminate the emergency order, then I think the legislature needs to do the work. Uh, to protect people and keep our state down uh, the right path. Um, and so um, if the legislature is willing to continue to stay and meet and, and respond to this uh, crisis, um, then I would vote to end the emergency power. But if we're not going to do that, we're just going to do this first um, and, and not do any of the, the work that we need to do to sustain some of these emergency executive orders, then I can't vote for this. Um, so I, I would urge um, members in this body to consider those factors as we move forward. If, if we are going to end the emergency order, then we've got to do the work. If we're not going to do the work, then it doesn't make any sense to have no one working on uh, limiting the spread of COVID. So thank you, Mr. President. Senator Gazelka. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and Senator Little and members. Uh, think about how many people, tens of thousands of people, were all together for uh, over eight days, uh, still crowds getting together of, of large numbers. And think about the fact that uh, of all of those people that got together and all of the increased testing that we've had, we're still under less than 3% of the people tested uh, actually have the virus. And then you, the, the key number that we measure is the number of deaths. That's where you really see what, what the numbers are because if, if you do a lot more tests, you're going to find more people that have the virus. But number of deaths haven't changed virtually at all. It's roughly 19 a day. Hasn't changed a bit. And so in, in light of the fact that it is, is not been what we thought it was going to be. We do have to get a handle on nursing homes. That's an area that we've been talking about that uh, needs to be paid attention to. But not much more than 200 deaths outside of nursing homes in Minnesota. That tells me we should get back to normal practicing safe distancing. We still need to do the things that they recommend, washing hands, covering your cough. If you're sick, stay home. But we have to move forward. And so 
and I think Senator Little is right that we need to keep working on the people's business, but we absolutely can do a lot of things in a special session in one week. Most special sessions are a day or two. I'm saying let's take eight days and let's move through this, but then have the chapter where we close because all of us know that there's many issues that we just don't come to agreement. Those can be continued to work on. And if there are other things that we need to do in the future, we can do them. And if we end emergency powers, which we should do, this is the longest peacetime emergency powers ever in Minnesota by quite a bit. But if we do end them, and say this fall the, the virus picks up in a way that uh, the governor chooses, he can declare emergency powers again. And so this, this is uh, something that is important for us to get back to normal. Schools get back up and opening. Summer activities, summer sports continue to go. Uh, and the only way it appears that we can do that is end the emergency powers and then move forward from there. Further discussion, Senator Jensen. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, colleagues. I do believe we are at a point where we need to end emergency powers, and for a variety of reasons. I would want to thank uh, Senator Little for some of his comments, because I think he's absolutely right. We need to make certain that we're not dropping the ball on any of the things that have been put in place over the last couple of months. To me, the action we're trying to take today has more to do with Governor Walz's passion for One Minnesota. We're moving away from One Minnesota. We're fragmenting Minnesota like it's never been fragmented before. One Minnesota was never meant to be one ruler for Minnesota. It's One Minnesota. We have 201 elected leaders that are willing to, as Governor Walz said, share in those calculated risks. I'm not going to do a deep dive into the numbers that Senator Little referred to in regards to an uptick in Arizona and things like that. There's all kinds of things we could be talking about in terms of innate immunity, disease resistance, how exactly do we read the results of the PCR tests, and what exactly do the IgG and the IgM mean when we get a positive serology test? We could go into that ad nauseum. This has more to do with Minnesota as one Minnesota. People want us together to work. We have eight days to get work done. If we don't get that work done in eight days and we think we can accomplish more, certainly the leaders of both bodies have indicated that they're willing to make an adjustment on that. Earlier this week, when I decided to sign on to a lawsuit against Governor Walls and his team as a petitioner, it gave me no great pleasure. But three specific points emerge. One is the executive orders smack of legislation without the legislative process. There's been no committee work, no vetting. This might be why more than 500 law enforcement agencies receive personal data about COVID-19 activity in households, which can easily be connected with a personal name. This is not the way we do our best work when we have executive orders do that, which could not be done through the normal legislative channels. If we're going to do that, that has to be true emergency. And as Senator Gazelka said, we have never been under peacetime emergency powers this long. The second concern is we have statute that exists that may well be in violation of the Constitution because the Constitution does not provide for the bicameral unification and then subsequent veto of an action. We don't have veto authority, and yet this is what we're relying on. And thirdly, public health matters, outbreaks, are something that we deal with virtually every year. The Congo is now dealing with their 11th Ebola virus in the last 40 years, their 11th Ebola epidemic outbreak. We have dealt with flu viruses every year, but some years it's been worse than others, and certainly in 2018 with 80,000 deaths and some 750,000 admissions to the hospital, we know what we're dealing with. There's a difference between 
urgency and crisis than there is emergency. We can work together with Governor Walls. The lawsuit that we filed is asking for the governor to explain why it's necessary to continue what we're doing. We can stop the emergency powers. We can work bipartisanly to get things done and to share the responsibility. And in so doing, we'll be more responsive to Minnesotans. So I wholeheartedly support the action we're trying to take today. And I hope that this can be a bipartisan vote to do just this. And I hope it's not seen as some sort of a personal attack on Governor Walls, but an absolute insistence on our part that we want to share the responsibility in moving forward, reopening our economy, and understanding more about the deaths and the disease that come from the desperation that has come from our actions in regards to COVID-19. Thank you, Mr. President. Further discussion on Senate Concurrent Resolution Number 1, Senator Housley. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I think when we look at terminating the emergency powers, we need to look at the science and the data. Um, and the science and the data behind how Governor Walls has failed the seniors in the state of Minnesota is overwhelming. Uh, we knew three weeks into this COVID that the majority of our deaths were going to be happening in our long-term care facilities. And then we knew a little bit after that, 81% of the deaths due to COVID happened in our long-term care facilities. Yet the governor and his administration failed to put 81% of their resources or 81% of their uh, uh, concerns on our long-term care facilities. They failed our long-term care facilities when it came to personal protective equipment. They were always last in line to get it. Uh, they didn't know how much they were going to have left, and once they had 48 hours of it left, it was panic among the staff there. Uh, our long-term care facilities, our nursing homes, were at the bottom of the pack also when it came to testing. The governor tested people publicly out on the street for free. They could just get in line and get tests if they wanted to, didn't have to have symptoms, didn't have to meet any criteria, yet they were begging for tests in our long-term care facilities. Uh, still, um, I have been asking for guidelines from the Department of Health and the governor. These residents of these long-term care facilities have been locked up for three months. They have no outside contact, no family visits. Uh, they are stuck. Uh, in their rooms for three months and still nothing from the governor on how we are going to get these family members to see their loved ones. Um, the science and data tells us that Governor Walls and his administration has really let the seniors in Minnesota down. I think the only way, I will continue to scream that from the mountaintop, I will, I will continue to fight for these people. They need an advocate here at the Capitol to, to fight for them. Um, and somebody, somebody here needs to say it, that Governor Walls has really failed the seniors in the state of Minnesota. And I will continue to say it until something changes. And in order for that to change, we need to end these emergency powers. Thank you, Mr. President. Further discussion, Senator Jensen. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I would request a roll call vote. Roll call has been requested. Roll call granted. Any further discussion, Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I think this is the wrong order for dealing with this legislation. If the majority believes that it is time to end the executive order, the first thing we have to do is figure out how to address all the things that would come to an end the day after the executive order ends. The human service programs that we've allowed to extend, the eviction prohibition, the protection for workers who complain about unsafe workplaces, which is a real concern at this time of a pandemic. Those protections all would disappear when the executive order ends. And so if, as proponents are saying, we want the legislature to be involved, I want the legislature to be involved too. But maybe those are the first things we should have. This bill should have this resolution before it comes up, we should have a whole range of things to figure out how we work our way through this, how we work it through. That's the reason there's been a crisis. There's the reason we've got executive order because of this. And I don't like this situation. I don't think there's anybody in the state that does. But to say that protection against evictions for people who have been out of work for a couple months now, the fact that they can't pay their rent, 
oh, they can get evicted. Well, then we're going to have a huge crisis from evictions next week if this were to become law. We're going to have a huge crisis from workers, people who are in their 60s and 70s who are still working every day, who need their jobs, who can't complain if they're sent back to work because if they do, they'll be fired, that their workplace is unsafe. They have no protection then because the law that gives them the protection is coming out of this executive order. And I agree that's not the ideal way to do it, but you can't say it's not ideal so we'll get rid of it. You have to replace it. You have to say here's how we're going to phase out of this because we all know at some point, whether it's a month from now or three months from now or six months from now, I hope sooner rather than later, as the pandemic subsides, as we find new ways to deal with it, as we have a vaccine, as we have whatever, that then we have to go back to, we remove these steps one at a time. But right now, Senator Abler's bill, which has a lot of important things in it, it doesn't even have, after his amendments, isn't going to have a 60-day phase out. So the day after the executive order ends, boom, the things just disappear. All the people with disabilities who need services, gone. All the protections for every worker, every business, every everything else. The executive order is not simply saying stay at home and close certain businesses now. Executive order gave a lot of protections for a lot of people, gave funding for a lot of things. And yes, none of us would choose to do it this way. But if we're going to do it, if we're going to say, hey, we want to be more involved, let's show our involvement by starting to figure out how we're going to phase out all these services that have been provided through this. Again, nobody thinks this is a great idea to have the executive order extended. I think the governor would be the first one to say he'd be glad to have it gone. But somebody's got to deal with the situation that we face, and somebody's got to take it real. And we as a legislature can't just say, we don't like everything about it, and therefore the governor made some mistakes perhaps, and so we will, we will just get rid of that, and then we'll figure out what to do. But those folks will be evicted by then. Those workers will be fired by then. Those people who have services, hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans have services will be cut off by then. Let's fix those issues if we're serious about cutting off the emergency order. Thanks. And I urge your vote against this resolution. Further discussion on Senate concurrent resolution number one, Senator Bigham. Thank you, Mr. President. You know, um, this is just a, a very important discussion that we're having to put into context, Mr. President, because I would just like to point out that the, the President of the United States has a, a peacetime executive order in place. So does the governor. This allows them to work collaboratively, efficiently, effectively together. And I think it's important that we even take that one step further and talk about what that means for our local partners. Um, I'm very in tune and very um, nervous, if you will, about getting the CARES money to our local government partners, our counties, our cities, and our towns. And we can't, uh, until possibly recently, um, haven't been able to agree on that. And we've been sitting on that for months now. And being able to help our local partners is extremely important having parity that the president has an executive orders and the governor does so that they can deliver these services, money, um, being able to do all of that brings better service for our residents. And then I think if you look at folks that support extending this, you're, you're talking about ARP, you're talking about the hospital association, you're talking about the nurses association, the Minnesota Medical Association, AFSCME, SEIU, these are all the people that deliver the care to our most vulnerable population. Um, my esteemed colleague from Lakeville and from Roseville both pr um, brought up a lot of good points about evictions and about um, uh, helping people in need uh, and how quickly these executive orders uh, go away and what that would mean. But there's one other thing I'd like to point out. Without this declaration, if a small business that, say, maybe had three employees got riveted with COVID and had to shut down, they would no longer have protection uh, for, for, and, and uh, availability from the state to help them in their time of need. So this is not the time to do this. Let's, let's put aside the, the 
partisanness and the um, poking at each other and and really let's let's move Minnesota forward. Let's let's make the most of this special session um, and and really do good work for Minnesota that I know this body wants to do because that's what I'm here to do, Mr. President. Further discussion, Senator Hayden. Well, thank you, Mr. Uh, President, and I am grateful for my colleague, Senator Bigham, who are, made some of the comments that I was going to make. I had been uh, given a, a list of, uh, of folks uh, that take care of our most vulnerable people who are asking us to extend it for reasons that we all know. I got a letter here from NAMI, Minnesota. You might know them uh, and the work that they do to advocate for people uh, with mental illness. Um, who uh, articulates uh, in this process uh, that them, along with Aspire uh, and others, uh, says it's granted key waivers that will ensure that people keep their insurance under medical assistance, Minnesota Care, and CHIPS, the child health care uh, uh, program that we have. It also extends public health emergency to ensure that mental health providers and their essential workers can continue to support their clients without putting themselves uh, at risk due to some of the telehealth things that we've done. And the Minnesota Nurses Association, you might know them as a large group, over 22,000 nurses that take care of the folks that uh, are, are come to the hospital and many others that have COVID-19 and other uh, issues that they have. And they uh, continue to say that they don't think now is the time. Uh, and those folks are taking care of our most vulnerable people. Oh, and then the Minnesota Medical Association. And so though I appreciate uh, Dr. Jensen and his explanation of the technicalities of how we might look at this disease and the, all of the things that he said that I can't regurgitate because he is so uh, clear in, in what we need to do. But they also said, the organization that represents doctors, uh, that they're in strong support of the peacetime emergency, and many of you may have those letters for some of the same reasons. Um, we also have a group of uh, professionals that uh, uh, ARC Minnesota Arm, Aspire, Autism Society of Minnesota, the Best Life Alliance, Catholic Charities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, Consumer Direct Care Network, Courage and Kinney Rehabilitation Institute, the Epilepsy Foundation, Fraser, and many more uh, that I would that I can't read. Who also talk about this issue in terms of how it's impacting their clients, who are disproportionately not only people with disabilities but also in communities of color uh, and indigenous pe people. And I, I think you guys, we saw in the last two weeks. Uh, black and brown people have been under attack, and I, I don't know why we would continue to, to, uh, to, to put them under further pressure uh, when these great organizations say that they would be attacked uh, and that this would not be something that is good uh, for them. And then lastly, some of you may like them and some of you may not, but I was a proud former member of ASME who works all throughout our systems in schools and in, in, in health care, uh, in our corrections department, and they do also have a long, lengthy reasons as to why we should continue this and, and not to move so quickly, uh, and that this conventional wisdom of, oh, well, there were five or 10,000 people together, and oh, they didn't get it. Well, I don't think we quite know that. Or, oh, um, somehow, um, you know, this is going to be better for everybody. And what happened in Arizona and all of these other places was somehow an anomaly. Maybe they have some genetic predisposition or some other reason that they don't get it. I think that they're the same as us. So uh, I, too, uh, think that we need to continue. And as it relates to the legislative process, let's get on with it. Let's, let's hear Senator Abler's bill. Let's, let's have Senator Limmer fire up that machine that they call the Judiciary Committee and start hearing bills around uh, criminal justice and law enforcement transformational reform. Uh, let the committee chairs uh, in the majority body start doing our work. And let's not put an arbitrary time. I appreciate Senator Gazelka and his leadership, but I'm not sure that he is the czar that says it's got to be two days, five days, 10 days, 11 days. We should do. Uh, what the citizens of Minnesota want us to do. We should get our work done. We should spend our time in committee getting our work done, figuring these things out so that we can do these things, so we can figure out. I, I really appreciate the great work, uh, frankly, that Senator Rosen has been doing on working on the CARES Act. It's taken a little bit longer than we wanted, but she's worked diligently to find a deal that most parties, they may not all be happy, but they certainly have agreed to it. That's the kind of work we need to get done. 
That's the kind of leadership that we need. And so our friends in all sectors are telling us uh, to keep this in place so that we can get our work done and then find agreement. Senator Weber and Senator uh, uh, Westrom, let's, let's, let's get that housing thing done. Let's not hold hostage uh, the money that we need to get out to make sure that families don't get evicted uh, for policy that you might want down the line. Let's, let's bifurcate those. Let's deal with what we need in an emergency. And then if you didn't take the time in your committee this year to figure out what reforms you want, then let that wait till next year. But let's actually focus on what we need today. Uh, members, we, we have been, we have been it, it, in Minnesota, we, we've been through a lot this, this year, 2020. We've certainly been a lot in the last two weeks. And so I would like to say that it would only affect me and my district because Mr. Floyd's death was eight blocks from my house and Lake Street is 12 blocks from my house, but it's affected us all. I've talked to people all around the world and all around the state, it's affected us all. So let's, let's stay focused. Let's get the work done that Minnesotans that need us immediately. And the peacetime emergency is really part of that process. Thank you, Mr. President. Next on the list, I have Senator Rood, followed by Senator Dibble. Senator Rood. Mr. President, thank you and members. The Brainerd Lakes region has the highest number of non-essential businesses in the state of Minnesota. They have been closed the longest. And who decided that all the businesses in my district were non-essential, that they aren't important to the economic engine in the state of Minnesota? No one in this chamber, no one in the legislature. The governor decided that my businesses in my district were non-essential, not important to the state of Minnesota. My chamber and my businesses have worked really hard to do everything the governor said. He said, wear masks, they wore masks. Stay home, they stayed home. Opening fishing, the DNR commissioner tells people, stay home. Don't stay overnight. Don't go farther than one tank of gas. Don't spend any money. Bring your own supplies. Don't come to Greater Minnesota. Don't spend money in the non-essential businesses in my district. So we went through opening fishing and my businesses. What's opening fishing in Greater Minnesota when you can't get in a boat, when you can't take your family fishing? But we survived. The businesses says, okay. The governor said, that's, that's what we need to do. That's what we need to do to stay safe. So we stayed safe. Then they said, well, make a plan. Make a plan and show us how you can be in business and be safe. So we did that. We put the plan together. We made masks. We actually have buffalo plaid masks for Paul Bunyan. And we did everything we were asked. We have over 100 businesses that submitted their business plans and how they can be safe to open in greater Minnesota. But folks, time is running out because we're coming up on the 4th of July. And if my businesses aren't open, they will be out of businesses. And I'm afraid many of them won't make it now. We just move the dial. This week, oh, I was so excited I got to sit in a blacktop parking lot on a picnic table and have my dinner. 50% open, what is that? I'm, I'm sitting in the parking lot on a picnic table when there's a beautiful dining area. My businesses know how to do business safely. They've got their plans in place. It's about time that we took this emergency power and the governor started working with us and working with our districts and our businesses. So I implore you today to vote for this resolution. Thank you. Next on the list is Senator Dibble followed by Senator Pratt. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President and members, if we were truly working uh, and intending to work collaboratively uh, with the governor uh, by voting uh, to end the, the peacetime, his authority to extend the peacetime emergency, um, that would be one thing. But I think it's important to listen closely to what we've heard come from members of the majority party as well as their counterparts in the other chamber. From the outset of the declaration, I've heard numerous members 
refer to the request by the governor that folks remain in their homes to the extent possible and reduce social distancing or to increase social distancing as house arrest. We, of course, have seen members uh, parading outside of the governor's house with members of the public who characterize his actions as the actions of a dictator and who characterize the whole pandemic as a hoax. We've heard members condition their support for important legislation that would benefit Minnesotans and help this economy upon his relinquishment, relinquishing the peacetime emergency declaration. In this chamber, we've debated efforts to hamstring the ability to expend funds that have made available that need to be mobilized very, very quickly to respond to the crisis in numerous ways, so much so that even if we're not in session, there would be no way for the governor and the executive branch to mobilize those resources to respond to what is an emergency. Yesterday, we saw the stock market drop in value in almost a record-setting loss in one day. And why? Because it responded to the spikes in the pandemic in places where everything was opened up very irresponsibly, telling us that we are far, far from over this pandemic and it's still a grave danger. It's transmissibility, it's mortality rate, much, much higher than anything we've contended with and it's much worse than the annual flu that we, that we deal with. Heard members of this body criticize the governor for not uh, d doing a deeper dive into you know, allowing chloroquine to be researched. Now we've shown that uh, despite the fact that the president takes it, it's, it's totally ineffective and in fact very harmful. We see uh, numerous members of this very chamber not wearing masks running around within one foot talking to each other face to face like this, clearly not taking this epidemic seriously, chortling at those of us who are running around with their masks and trying to take it seriously, not so much to protect our own health, but to make sure that we're not carrying it back to friends and family who themselves are vulnerable out of respect and regard for our family and our fellow citizens. And in this very chamber, and running around these hallways, members of this body not wearing masks, thinking this is all a joke and a hoax. So this is what we're being asked to do. Be partners with the governor who is using data, who's using research, who's trying to be responsible and also sensitive uh, to the effects on the economy, who's slowly ramping back as data and evidence permits. So members, if we're truly trying to be a partner with the governor and exercise the authority of this branch, if we had been uh, demonstrated less bad faith that I've witnessed in social media, out in the public, in this chamber, I might be willing to consider this, this idea. But I think it's far too important, the risks are too great, and we absolutely have to be responding to what Minnesotans need to stay safe and also respond to the responsible use of authority to start opening up the economy and letting people go about their business. And I think that's what the governor has been doing. And on, as to the issue of the, the number of deaths uh, and illness that have occurred in our long-term care settings and our seniors, the fact is, is that we've been reporting uh, differently and in greater numbers and the, and the uh, federal agency CMS puts us right in the middle of the pack. So the governor hasn't failed us. I certainly think we could do more and do better and, and we're making strides and in fact to have a bill that's being introduced today that calls for um, various kinds of measures for COVID-19 transmission protection in those settings. Um, but I need to correct the record. We are right average in the middle of the pack in terms of the level of infection com as compared to other states. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, if I could, Senator Benson for um, Senator Senator Dibble characterized uh, some of the 
members of this body as acting in bad faith and not taking this seriously. And I uh, let him finish his comments without interruption because we are talking about grave matters. But I feel that is an unfair characterization of the behavior of the members of this body. And I want it noted. Members, just a, a reminder, don't impugn motives of, of other members on the floor. Okay, next on the list, I have Senator Pratt, followed by Senator Johnson. Senator Pratt. Or, uh, and to be able to act quickly. And since the legislature was still in session, we expected the governor to work collaboratively with us. However, Governor Walls has moved generally in a unilateral manner. I would often hear of changes that impacted my committee and, and uh, uh, my jurisdiction no more than an hour before the governor's daily briefings. And quite honestly, I already knew what they were going to be because they had been out on social media for several hours ahead of that. But let's talk about the purpose of the emergency powers. The emergency powers were meant to shore up our supplies, to flatten the curve, and not to overwhelm our health care system. We also discussed that we could see, we also saw that we, we could see a spring peak and also discussed the potential of another spike of infections this fall. For several weeks, we supported the governor to prepare the state and to save lives. Members, after three months, we should be prepared. Back in April, I encouraged the governor and his administration to take a more balanced approach to the emergency, addressing both the economic as well as the health care crisis. We had a bipartisan Senate COVID working group where landscapers came and talked about how they could keep their customers and their employees safe. And it still took nearly uh, eight to 10 days before the governor was willing to uh, move forward on that. We had the same issue with dock installation. We had the same issue with golf courses. Everything has been micromanaged. Uh, in Scott County, our small shops felt they could keep their customers more safe than some of the big box stores. And they couldn't figure out why they selling the same type of, of merchandise couldn't be open. We had our restaurants get together and say, here's how we can keep our customers, our employees safe, because we don't want to spread the virus. That fell on deaf ears. That was back in April. Members, we have had over 700,000 Minnesotans apply for unemployment. And as we heard just yesterday in the jobs committee, that's over 24% of our workforce is unemployed. So I guess the question I have, members, is how long is our emergency? Will the emergency powers be used until the end of this governor's term? And what is the emergency we're facing today as we see the 14-day moving average going down? Our response has been worse than many of our neighboring states when we look at deaths per capita. And so, members, I ask you, if not now, when? Thank you, Mr. President. Further discussion, I have Senator Johnson followed by Senator Benson. Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, so I, I know we've gotten into a lot of aspects of this today. And a lot of emotions, a lot of stories of individuals, but I want to get back down to the basic question that I asked uh, about a month ago, was under 1231, there are two things that you need. You need a public emergency, which we clearly have uh, with COVID-19. The other thing is you need inadequate local supplies. The governor has had three to four months to get those supplies. We as a legislature have voted in $550 million to make sure the, government, the governor had the tools to provide our counties those supplies. So after four months, if we're not able to give our counties, our towns, our townships, our communities those supplies, I think it's time to take another tact at that. In the governor's letter that called 
us back. He said that the local resources continue to be inadequate to address the burden imposed by the global pandemic. If that's the case, members, if that's the case, Mr. President, then maybe we need to try something new. I think Senator Rosen has a bill that takes the CARES money that was provided by the federal government and, and allocates that out to our communities so that that financial burden from all the preparedness, all the resources, all the things that our communities have been doing and putting in place and are prepared to do uh, can be paid for and the burden is relieved from our communities. So I think right now is a great time to put the burden back on the legislature to represent the communities that we were sent here to represent, to get the resources that are needed to get to our communities. And this is the, the next step that needs to happen. So I urge that we pass this resolution. Thank you very much, thank you very much Mr. President. Next on the list, I have Senator Benson, followed by Senator Westrom. Senator Benson. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, we have learned a tremendous amount about this virus. We are going to continue to learn. Uh, I was going through my notes. February 27th, my first phone call with Dr. Osterholm. February 28th, my first phone call with them, Fairview, and them explaining that we were not going to have enough ICU beds and we needed to buy time. We needed to slow the spread, flatten the curve. March 10th, my notes from the Hospital Association and the Long-Term Care Association. Their number one priority was to protect their staff. I made a phone call to the VP at 3M to see if there was any way that we could get more protective equipment for our staff. So reliving that, members, think about what we were doing. And then this body on March 16th and March 17th passed unprecedented amounts of money to support the people who were going to have to provide the care for something that we didn't understand but we knew was coming. Every single Minnesotan was on board. Our churches shut down. Our legislature stepped back. Our counties stepped up. Their public health dove in to the deep end of the pool and did their very best to make sure we were going to be ready. The hospitals and care centers, without much guidance, were they allowed to put up a barrier in an isolation space? Because nursing home regulations say you can't do that, but infection control protocols say that you should. And they did their best. Our businesses said, yes, we will do what it takes. It is going to hurt. Thank God for the federal loan programs that supported payroll to bridge them. Minnesotans knew they were going to have to spend time away from loved ones. Major religious celebrations set aside, I'll try. celebrated quietly in homes. We've learned a lot. It will be our habit for a very long time to wash our hands for 20 seconds. I'm guessing every member of this chamber and most of the people listening to me have a song or prayer that they say while they're washing their hands so they can remember what 20 seconds feels like. Some will wear masks to protect themselves and the people around them. Businesses will be more cautious about infection management protocols. Our nursing homes and hospitals will be forever changed. No one is taking this lightly, but we have learned so much. And the one-size-fits-all approach isn't fitting for some Minnesotans, and it's not because they don't care. It's because they think they've learned, and they will choose to do the right thing, and they will choose to take care of each other. They will be cautious about where their kids play and how they play. They'll make sure they wash their hands as soon as they come in the door. When I'm going to visit my parents, I bring a change of clothes so I don't bring things into their home that I wouldn't want in their home. I wash my hands a lot. We are different because of this virus, and it's because we are different that we can open up. The governor can come to the legislature and ask for things just as the hospitals and nursing homes have. 
just as MDH has, just as the Department of Human Services has. We consult, we work together, and that's how the right solution for Minnesota comes forward. This isn't about recklessness. This is about the fact that we can work with the governor and we can trust Minnesotans to do the next right thing. I'll be supporting this resolution, members, and I hope you will as well. Next on the list, I have Senator Westrom, followed by Senator Matthews. Senator Westrom. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, members, I rise to support the removal of the emergency powers that our governor has now continued going on 120 days under this latest declaration. Members, it is time to lift the emergency and work with the legislature in any responses that are needed. As you've just heard Senator Benson talk about, there has been a lot learned in 100, 100 days, 90 days. The emergency in March, everybody was caught by surprise. The governor used his rarely used powers that statutes reserve for unique and times that the legislature somehow can't respond. But the statute isn't to exclude the legislature ongoing. And as we go into continued emergency powers, that is the effect of keeping these emergency powers in place removing and stripping the legislature of nearly all its power and controlling all the citizens across the state of Minnesota, not leaving them up to local circumstances and local control and individual decisions based on information we are now able to share with them. Local officials have reacted very positively, very seriously, Business owners, health care providers, and the legislature has even reacted with emergency funding that we passed within days of hearing about this pandemic that was looming and coming and here. So the first 30 days, the emergency is understandable. Members, the emergency powers weren't intended to be a new form of government or a new way of life for the entire state of Minnesota as long as one person in the governor's office wanted to continue it that way just by using that statute in a misguided, inappropriate way that wasn't intended when it was passed. Now that we're on number four, emergency, one has to really wonder, when does the emergency end? The numbers that were modeled and predicted were much higher than they've become in reality. We've bent the curve, we've flattened the curve, we've responded very well. Thankfully, the virus hasn't ran through populations as much and as big in numbers as was predicted. That's all good news. But once that reaction, once that emergency in the beginning was at a place where we could manage it, it is time to let the normal government, the legislative branch and the executive branch work together and respond. And that's what this vote is about. Let the legislature continue to represent the districts we represent along with the governor and bring those voices and concerns and not have a one-size-fits-all policy continue. I had a small restaurant in my district, Shady's Hometown Tavern, and they found out the hard way. But they found out on behalf of hundreds and thousands of other small 
businesses and restaurants trying to do what they do best, run a safe business, provide food and enjoyment to the public, but the necessary need to eat comes about every four or five hours a day, morning, noon, and night. And that's what these restaurants have built their reputation, built their businesses on. But in mid-May, when they were trying to reopen, boy, did we see the big hand of government come down from the Attorney General and the Governor's office, representing what they would do to every group out there, every restaurant out there, if they tried to take matters in their own hand, assess their local situation, come up with their own plans and ways to safely serve their customers, continue their livelihoods, and keep their businesses afloat. They were threatened with $25,000 a day fines from the governor and the attorney general, plus any profits they make for those days they were open, plus jail time. That's pretty heavy-handed, members. And that's what these emergency powers have come to. Other groups, then and since, haven't had that kind of threat brought to them. The point is, members, everybody can make reasonable, free choice decisions based on medical information, best practices, best information for their circumstances, as they factor in all of the reasons they might do something or not do something. Refrain from going to church, refrain from going to a restaurant, or go to a restaurant, go to a store, because they need it. They want it, or whatever the reason is. We don't need government to be making those decisions with one person at the top controlling those dials, quote unquote. And in my district, community of 5,000 is the biggest community I represent. We've got a lot of small retail stores, a few box stores, a whole mixture. But somewhere in this emergency process, it was one person that got to decide what was essential, what retail could safely reopen, and what, which ones could not. The big box stores, they got lucky. The small retailers didn't get so lucky. The salons, even the salons with just one beautician or barber in them. How do you, how do you operate a barber shop or a salon at 25% capacity when you are the only stylist in there? Do you, do you sit around six of the eight hours? Really? Or do you just open up from 9 to 11 or 8 to 10 and then you close for the rest of the day? Is that the intent of 25% open when nobody else is in the salon? That's how ridiculous one-size-fits-all these decisions have been under these emergency powers. We've responded to the emergency. The ambulance has been called. They're on the scene. We've had time to react. But we are going on now one-third of this year being a government of one. One person in charge in the governor's office by a misuse of a statute that wasn't intended to be an ongoing new form of government under the guise of an emergency. When will the emergency end? Because if we spike this fall, you might have a new emergency, but if the old one hasn't even ended, when does it end? And this emergency is creating more emergencies because of all the livelihoods that are at stake across my district, across our state. We've all heard the stories. I get the emails, I get the calls. And so, members, it is time 
to stop this misuse of the emergency powers that is going on one-third of this year now and excluding the legislature. There's many of these decisions we may have to make. You all know we have passed multiple bills responding to this emergency, many of them in several days only. Hundreds of millions of dollars. We can react, but we all bring some perspective that is helpful to deciding how to react to this statewide. And reacting statewide when there's geographic areas with hot spots is an overuse of the statute and the emergency powers. You've heard me talk about this before. I remember the debate when this change was made on the emergency powers. And the legislature never conceived that a governor would be so power hungry that they're going to quarantine the entire state. The discussion revolved around giving the governor limited powers intended to be maybe 30 days, but maybe to have the authority to quarantine an area in a community or an area or a community that's got a hot spot or of a, of a contagious disease until they can get it under control. Never was the discussion that I recall about giving the governor authority to quarantine everybody in the state of Minnesota for weeks and weeks and weeks, the healthy and the unhealthy. And sure, we all decided, hey, we're a little uncertain here too. And most people complied for several days, for several weeks, even a month, month and a half. But at some point, you have to get back to normalcy or return to a state of being able to have a livelihood and live in a free country. And continuing government emergency powers for over one fourth of the or one third of the year. And there's no sign right now of the governor even backing off next month. In his announcement two days ago, he's talking about emergency powers continuing on July 13th already, giving us a preview of another month he's probably going to continue these emergency powers. So members, if another emergency continues or happens, he can call an emergency again. He has 30 days. If the legislature is not in session, he does have to call us back. The statute tried to have a balance of the legislature and the governor working together on this, and that's how it should work. And Minnesotans need to know it has not been working that way for the last three months. The legislature needs to get back engaged, be able to be a partner with the governor. Senator Dibble talked about a partnership that we were having with the governor. I don't know what partnership he's referring to, the partnership has been a one-way street, the governor calling the shots, one size fits all for my district, his district, Senator Dibble's district, and everybody in between. He's right, Senator Dibble is. We do need a partnership, but that hasn't been existing. If the last three months has been an example of what you call a partnership, somebody needs to change the dictionary, contact Webster to do that. Because a partnership is the governor and the legislature working together. The legislature handling the finances and the policy, sending it to the governor with, their, with his input, and signing a bill that everybody can agree to, and focusing the powers, focusing the dollars, focusing the response to where it really needs to be. Senator Dibble talked about how quick we need to react. The governor called us back today with less than a two-day notice. We can come back even quicker than that if he works with our leadership, if he works with us, and tells us what he's doing. But if you don't communicate on a two-way street, it's going to be much harder for the legislature to be a good partner. But you can't call this last three months a partnership when it's been one size fits all for the entire state and one person, one office in the executive branch making all the decisions. So members, for all of those reasons, 
You've heard them. You've seen them. You've seen the livelihoods and the families that have immense pressure, immense mental health issues, immense health issues, immense financial issues, concerns about food security and food supply, all caused out of the emergency powers and this pandemic. We're responding to that. But members, it's time for the legislature to be a partner again, like our forefathers intended. And so for that reason, it is time to vote to terminate the emergency powers of the governor and have the legislature and the governor work together on this and we can come up with good solutions as they're needed for the state of Minnesota and keep people protected, safe, and respond as we've shown we can do in the past emergency bills we've passed in March and April in the past session. I urge your support of this bill. Next on the list, I have Senator Matthews followed by Senator Hall. Senator Matthews. Thank you, Mr. President. I too rise to support this resolution, and it's been a long time coming. Mr. President, Governor Walls has been applying his executive powers in a manner that has been taking away the liberties and rights of many Minnesotans these last three months. And what was for a good intent in the beginning has stretched out and become an unconstitutional use of government force by one person. Let me highlight one of the executive orders where he decided to unilaterally up the penalties for violating it, I believe from a misdemeanor to a gross misdemeanor, greatly increase the monetary fine. Members, that's a decision for this legislative branch. We're the, the House and the Senate together are the ones to debate that, to decide what crimes are, are listed at certain levels and to pass that, and then we're held accountable to our district. What happened in this case? One person. One person made the call to say you're going to get a higher penalty for violating this particular order. That's not what our Constitution says we can do. Right now we have the government actively saying that if you want to go out in large groups in these last couple of weeks and you have a message, one particular message in one way, then you're encouraged. There's very few restrictions. There have been loud, large crowds gathered for an important issue. And I agree that the issue that has been on our streets in Minneapolis and St. Paul is very important. But at the same time, if you want to go out and speak on other issues, or if you want to go to church, or you want to have meetings on other areas, you have much tighter restrictions around you, crowd sizes, safety measures. The standards are not the same depending on your message. And members, that is a textbook example of a First Amendment violation of free speech. Furthermore, Governor Walls has been violating First Amendment right to practicing religion, because the Constitution tells us that the government is not to prohibit the free exercise of religion. And I had many discussions with churches in my district. I was on calls with large groups of pastors around the state of Minnesota. I was in contact with the pastor of my own church back home uh, near where I live, where we were discussing. And early on, many pastors and many churches said we understood the immediacy early on when we didn't know how this virus would act, when we didn't know how fast it might spread. We wanted to keep our members safe. And so we did agree with going ahead and voluntarily closing our doors to make sure that people stayed safe. Some churches were able to utilize other means, Facebook Live, internet streams, other opportunities that are out there. My church and many others in the rural communities do not have those capabilities and could not do that. 
We just were flat closed. There was a weekly email with some encouragement, with a list of links to YouTube songs and a link to a previous message to try to keep encouraging one another. But that's not the practicing of our religion that the Constitution gives us freedom for. And the longer and longer this went on, more and more churches started saying, if the governor does not allow us, we're going to just open anyways because it's our right before God and it's still a right that's recognized in this country. And we had, I don't remember if it was a month ago, six weeks ago, sometime, where there was an announcement that was coming, I believe on a Thursday afternoon, that Governor Walls was going to adjust the dials and make some distinctions for small businesses, for other groups. Uh, and I've been paying attention mainly on the business side and on the church side. And it was explicitly stated, there's no change for churches. The regulations will remain the same. You're still gonna be under the same regulations as before. And the church group stood up that afternoon and said enough is enough. The Catholic uh, diocese here in Minnesota started it. One of the Lutheran church denominations followed suit that same day and said, Governor, with all due respect, we know that we can hold meetings, hold church services safely. We're gonna go ahead and open up in a safe and responsible manner, which is what we're expected to do even now. Suddenly this put Governor Walls in tension. He was going to be a leader with no followers. And magically, within about two days, on Saturday there was a new announcement. Suddenly it was okay to do the things that were not okay two days prior. I propose to you that it still was safe to do two days ago. It took churches standing up and speaking about their God-given rights and constitutional rights to make the governor change his mind. And still today there's restrictions in place and I think they need to be removed and lifted and let churches worship freely as they're required to do and as the government is required to recognize their ability to do. And one last point, Mr. President and members, Senator Westrom mentioned the Shady's restaurant, the owners there. Uh, one of his locations is in my district and I've been working on this from the business side as well for many weeks now. And I believe he lives near my district and one of his locations is in my district. And he was going to open up because many people have been saying enough is enough. The data is not there, the science is not there, and the rules are not being evenly applied to everyone. And we saw, as the story has already been shared, he was going to open up and Governor Walls and Attorney General Ellison swiftly and immediately cracked down. Yesterday I was speaking with one of my sheriffs, one of my law enforcement leaders in my district, and he made note of that story. He brought it up in our conversation. And he said, Senator, I've been in this business many years and I have seen many circumstances where there are legitimate need for someone, for an individual or a family to get a temporary restraining order and have not been able to get one. How in the world was one restaurant owner, in just a matter of hours, had a TRO filed against him before he even did anything, before he actually opened up? It seems political to me. And I said, Sheriff, you know what? You're absolutely right. It's been long past time to remove these powers to make the legislature and the governor work together I urge members to support this resolution. Next on the list, I have Senator Hall, followed by Senator Senjum. Senator Hall. It's on your desk, Senator Hall. There you go. Thank you, Mr. President, members. Uh, we've heard some good speeches. Uh, Senator Matthews, uh, I appreciate what you had to say there. Uh, it's about God and country, 
It's about holding up to our Constitution. It's about the freedoms, the God-given freedoms that we have. So members, uh, I'm not here to remove the powers from our governor. That is not what I'm voting for this bill. Matter of fact, I think the governor, before we get done, should relinquish his powers so his members of his party don't have to vote against this and their governor. What the governor has done, probably since the first three weeks, because the first three weeks we were all pretty tense on the situation, and we were all backing the governor. But since then, some of his decisions have really put in jeopardy our state. There are Democrats here that are going to have to vote for this bill. They don't want to. I heard that, I think, from Senator Little. He, I don't think he really wants to vote. He'll, I mean, he would vote for the bill today, but he's found a reason not to. I may not agree with it, but if that's his reason, that's his reason. I'm voting today to open up Minnesota, that we can be one Minnesota as the governor always says we are. He has brought division, not unity. Because freedom is at the core of those of us that are Americans, and all of us are. You don't quarantine the healthy, you quarantine the sick. We started out trying to advise the governor through Senator Gazelka. And that worked for a while until the governor stopped listening. He became the only one that really had the answers. And that's not the team effort that Minnesota was built on. We have three branches for a reason. You're hearing from the governor if you're hearing. You're hearing from one side of the aisle. You're not getting a broad spectrum if he's not at least listening to Senator Gazelka. And if he's not listening to the House and the Senate. And that's what it's all about. Getting wise wisdom from many. And then we started seeing the picking and choosing. It looked political, or at least it looked like it was going against my values and maybe the values of my party. I'm not saying that one party has the values and the other party doesn't, but there's a degree of value. I value being able to go to church, having the freedom of the Constitution and religious freedom that the First Amendment offers. Those are diverse values that we should be listening to. A wide spectrum. I want to trust the Minnesotans as Americans, as a free people, to make decisions for themselves. Not to have a governor that's doing it by himself, telling us what we have to do when we've done nothing wrong. I've heard a lot of people say he's a hypocrite. He lacks consistency. Look at the funerals and how we can't go to him, but he can close, and it doesn't look good. I tried, after a month of, of this, I tried to have a rally on the Capitol for my daughter with a hundred. She said, I think I maybe can get a hundred hairstylists to come onto the Capitol grounds. And we'll stay six feet apart and we'll wear masks because we're not trying to break the laws. And so I went to the administration and I said, can we do this? She said, it's closed. I said, I know it's closed. Mr. President. But, but can we do this? Can Senator we? Kent, hold on, Senator Hall. Senator Kent, for what reason do you rise? Thank you, Mr. President. I rise um, for a point of order.
What is your point of order, Senator Kent? Um, Mr. President, you have already reminded the chamber and we have now had two other cases of people uh, questioning motives and characterizing um, people's intentions here. And so I would ask that you please remind members again not to do so. Thank you, Senator Kent, for the reminder. Senator Hall. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm not uh, giving motives for anybody in their character. Like I said, I'm not judging. The public will do the judging on this. But what I want to go back to that story, so I'm denied because they said the grounds, the grass is, is uh, closed. She got back to me two days later and she said, you can call the Capitol Police. So I called the Capitol Police and I said, can I have a demonstration? They said, you should uh, get a permit. I said, they won't give me a permit. And he said, well, then you can't do it. I said, we're just going on the grass. We'll stay a distance apart. They, I said, what happens if we do it? He said, you'll be removed. The other day, I saw thousands of people out there. And somebody turns a blind eye. That really feels like it's not a one Minnesota. It feels like if you agree with the governor, you can do a lot of things, if you, and if he wants to, but otherwise, you can't. And that's not what this government was made up of. We are made up of a lot of different types of people, and everybody should be heard. Everybody. Churches, synagogues, mosques, all of us should be heard. We are about faith, family, and freedom. My faith and people like me and my values are being hindered. My family is suffering. Loss of jobs, loss of, of uh, finances. Businesses are suffering right now. There's a freedom we don't have and we need to get back to. Freedom of being Americans. Freedom of being Americans. Senator Kent, freedom of being Americans. And I am tired of being shut up and shut down and having told you got to wear a mask and stay inside. I'm free to do what I want to do. But we are law abiding until these past weeks when the frustration of Minnesotans exploded. For a good reason in one sense, but not to burn places down. I got threatened at a rally because I had a red hat on. There was no words on it. You better take that hat off, he said. Are you kidding me? So I hope the governor relinquishes his authority before we're done with this vote. And if not, I feel sorry for the Democrats here that have to vote for, uh, against this, but you need to do what you got to do. This shutdown, members, is killing us. Please vote yes on this bill. Next on the list, I have Senator Senjum, followed by Senator Jasinski. Senator Senjum. Thank you, Mr. Pr Mr. President, is, is the microphone on? It is. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Members, uh, I uh, rise today uh, to talk, uh, I think, more briefly than most, but uh, hopefully uh, to a point that I just want to bring up. And that is, uh, you look around this place and it's a pretty nice place. Uh, Minnesota is a pretty nice place to be a part of uh, our government in. 115 years ago, people walked through this front door. They came here to work, and they've worked here year after year after year, and they, and they work around an element of trust. And that's to what I want to speak here today, the whole issue of trust. Governor Walz, uh, some 120 days ago or so, put together a, an emergency order built around the element of trust. In fact, the lack of trust. Not to fault him on it, we were facing 74,000 deaths looking us right in the eye. He needed to do it. He needed to give time and instruction to the state of Minnesota so that they could become familiar with not only with this issue, but with relatively cautions to take, prevent those 74,000 deaths. 
it's worked pretty well. I think we all know that. But as we uh, now look at ourselves and look at where we are, I think it's time to trust Minnesotans. It's time to trust the legislature. It's time legislatures, senators here in this room, it's time to trust ourselves in the stand of working with our governor on this issue. We are far stronger together than you are working separately and sometimes, frankly, at odds with the governor on this issue. We can do this. We need to do this. It's time to bring this issue collectively together with the governor's office and the legislature. And we build it, we do it around an element of trust. So I would say, Governor, it's time to trust your people. I would say, Senator, it's time to trust ourselves. Time to trust ourselves with the fact that we can work with the governor on this program, that we can, in fact, go forward in the right sort of way, and that Minnesota is ready. They're trained. They know how to deal with this issue. They're ready to take it themselves. We don't need executive powers anymore to get us there. We know where to go. We know how to, how to do it, and we can do it by trusting ourselves. So, Mr. President and members, uh, my word today to the governor and to this body is trust. Let's put some trust in ourselves. Governor, put some trust in your state and collectively we can move through this and out of this in the kind of fashion that we ought to. Trust Minnesota. We're a great state. We're a great people. We can do this. Next on the list, I have Senator Jasinski followed by Senator Little. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. I stand here today as well to support this resolution for the governor to end his executive powers. My district, all our districts are about 80,000 people. We've had three deaths in my district, three. And we value all those people and their deaths. Uh, but two of them were long-term care facilities. One was a, a, by a gentleman who was traveling afar when it first broke out. Other than that, that's it, three deaths. I've counted 35 businesses that will not reopen in my district. 35 valuable businesses already. Now, there'll be many more that will never open again. Rural Minnesota is not the same as the metro. Again, three deaths in my district. That's it, three. And again, we value those, but uh, we value people crossing the street or getting hit by a car or killed on a snowmobile accident or in an automobile accident. We can't stop everything because of what's going on. We have to live our lives. As everybody said before, the executive powers were very valuable in the beginning, but we've gone on and on and on, and in the same time, our businesses have gone down and down and down. The bar owners, the resort owners, the small shop owners, the hair salons, the nail salons, everything that have suffered tremendously because of this. Very difficult to them. I came here as a mayor, eight years, nonpartisan, didn't get involved. One of the stories I've told to one of my good friends here who's on the other side of the aisle, when I used to go to the grocery store, everybody wanted to talk to me as a mayor. Everybody did. Then I got nominated as a Republican candidate for the Senate. And half the people went the other way when they saw me in the supermarket. That's sad. But I'll tell you what, when I go in the supermarket today, they're all talking to me. They're all talking again to me and saying, what is going on in this state? What is the governor doing? He is killing our district. He is killing our city. He's killing our counties. He's killing our state. We need to take the executive powers away and let us do our work in the legislature. Please vote for this resolution. Thank you, Mr. President. Next on the list, I have Senator Little, followed by Senator Rosen. Senator Little. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I think a lot of us agree with what is being said. Um, and like I said at the beginning, I think if the legislature is willing to do the work and create a plan uh, going forward after today, uh, let's do that, but we have to do that work before we just get rid of everything. Um, you know, I was having some conversations online today on Facebook uh, where people were asking, well, what is the actual effect of getting rid of the peacetime emergency? And the effect of that is these executive orders, as we covered earlier today, would be eliminated. And I think people were kind of surprised to hear that because some of the executive orders people really appreciate and respect because they know it's keeping some people safe. Um, so in that vein, Mr. President, I offer the A50. 
Senator Little offers the A50 amendment. The Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Little moves to amend Senate concurrent resolution number one as follows, page one, line 11, delete. This is the A50 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Little. Uh, thank you again, Mr. President. So the A50 amendment would um, codify uh, into this resolution um, the executive order 2054. Uh, 2054, as I covered in my previous speech, is the one that uh, disallows discrimination against uh, any employee that wants to wear uh, masks um, and gloves or other PPE that they need. Um, it also prevents anybody um, from being retaliated against or discriminated against if they don't feel like that is a safe workplace they can go into. Uh, the other major provision is um, that someone who uh, is not being accommodated and feels they have to resign in over order to protect themselves would still be eligible uh, for unemployment. Um, so I think this executive order is, is really important to protect people and, uh, and make sure that they can stay safe and they can uh, make their own decisions, as um, uh, many senators here have noted. Thank you, Mr. President. Further discussion on the A50 amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor of the amendment, say aye. aye. Opposed, say no. We will take a brief pause to gather the votes of the members in alternate locations. The members uh, who support the A50 amendment in the chamber, if you have not been voted in another, if you have not been recorded in another room, if you are in support of the A50 amendment, please stand at your desk. Okay, you may be seated. If you are opposed to the A50 amendment in the chamber, please stand at your desk. Okay.
On a vote of 28 in favor, 23 opposed, the motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Members, we are back on Senate concurrent resolution number one as amended. Senator Nelson, followed by Senator Kent. Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. President and members. I stand in favor of the resolution. Certainly, Minnesotans have stepped up. Minnesotans have changed their lives. We have learned how to social distance. We have made thousands, tens of thousands of masks. And the time has come when this peacetime emergency powers end. An emergency means an emergency. Uh, this has been continuing now for months. And while there may have been an emergency right away, and I believe there was, and I would not have supported earlier resolutions to end the governor's peacetime emergency. But now is the time. This is the right time. Minnesotans know how to keep themselves and others safe. Minnesotans have proven that they care for one another. It is time that this peacetime emergency be rescinded. I expect that we will pass this in the Minnesota Senate today, and it will be up to the House. It requires, of course, the House and the Senate to rescind the peacetime emergency powers. And it is time that we trust Minnesotans to do what they know is right. And it's not even feasible that we would think that one person, even the governor of the state of Minnesota, would have the knowledge, the expertise to know all of the industries within our state, to understand what's happening in each and every one of our districts. That is why it's time that the full legislature be involved going forward. I have every confidence. I have heard uh, those say, well, what if there is a spike in the fall? And quite frankly, there very well could be. We hope this is not like the last great pandemic, the Spanish flu, where it came back. You might recall St. Paul was spared largely in the first year. But in the second year, it came back and much more severe. We don't know if that's going to happen with this pandemic or not. We hope not. We are in a different place than we were 100 years ago. We have technology, we have innovations, and we have medical advancements that were not available then. However, that would be a new emergency. Right now, it is essential that we trust every Minnesotan to do what they already know, what our society expects, and what we have been doing for months. And that is those five things, you know, do the five. The five things. Don't touch your face, don't touch your eyes, cough into your elbow, stay home if you are sick, good hygiene. And of course, we have learned social distancing. We almost do it without thinking now. So the time has come, members. I urge a green vote. Let us return Minnesotans their freedom, their economic opportunities, knowing that they know best how to proceed safely. I encourage a green vote. Further discussion on the resolution, Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President. This, is, this discussion for the last hour or so has been, all the proponents seem to be talking about simply businesses and business opening. 
And the emergency doesn't deal just with that. It deals with that and thousands of other things. Senator Little's amendment made the bill less troubling by one executive order. There's a whole slew of executive's orders that we have to address. And they have to be addressed before we decide we're going to shut down the emergency. The people who are vulnerable and forced to go back to work, Senator Nelson says, well, they can just stay home. What protections are they going to have? The renters who can't pay the rent, they're going to be evicted. They have no protection. That all goes away. I understand the concern about businesses being open. You know, it, it's not like the governor, he's the one, the only one who shut down things. You allow businesses to open. Not every one of them is opening up because they feel in their kind of condition they're not able to. Even when they're being allowed to, they're not taking advantage of it. And frankly, not all their customers are coming back right away anyway. We don't know what's going to happen to the economy long term. We know it's frightening. Stock market yesterday, upon finding out what happens when there's a re-uptick in this, took a deep hit. But the point is this executive order is not one thing, and we're talking about only one aspect of it. If you really think that the governor's making such a huge mistake on employment, deal with that one aspect. Don't pass everything and just throw out everything from renter protections to worker protections to the emergency worker people trying to go in and they, Senator Little took care of the one part of it so you can't discriminate against them for wearing masks and stuff. But take care of the rest of it before you say, we're gonna just shut down the emergency order. It's not that simple. It's not like the governor just sat down and wrote a couple of pages of stuff. We've had executive order after executive order. And if you think they're all bad, some of them I haven't heard a single word of complaint about from any member of the legislature of either party because we all agree with them. But we're going to throw them all out because we don't like one part of it? I urge you to think twice before you vote to throw out the whole thing. Next on my list, I have Senator Frentz followed by Senator Kent. Senator Frentz. You have a switch on the desk. Senator Frentz. Again, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I urge members to vote no on this resolution. We should not remove the governor's emergency powers. 49 of 50 states' governors still have emergency powers. Why would it be that those 49 states, with their wisdom, run by both parties, run by hardworking men and women, would decide to keep emergency powers in effect, and Minnesota would be the one state to eliminate them legislatively? We are doing a good job, and it is not just the governor, it's the people of the administration of the people of Minnesota. One example, the Commissioner of Health, Jan Malcolm. I have been impressed by the work that's being done by the Department of Health, the effort of the team, the epidemiologist staff, and all of them. What are they doing? They're saving Minnesotan lives. That should be a priority for us. We also have failed to reach agreements that the administration can support. One example, cities and counties. We need to get that money out to cities and counties. We need to strike an agreement. We have not done so. We're now in special session, and the cities and counties of Minnesota are saying, why can't you guys reach a deal? It does not encourage the people of Minnesota to remove the governor's executive powers when the legislature can't get things done. It's been said here, but where's repeating? The federal government and the president of the United States has retained emergency powers. What is it about the federal government that requires the use of emergency powers that the state of Minnesota does not have the same need? And finally, I would just say, members, there's been a lot of talk today about how we can work together to work with the governor. Well, if you can work with the governor, here is your chance. We've talked about the polling and the support that the people of Minnesota have for this governor. We've talked about the ways in which we can reach agreement, and you can count on the minority party of this Senate to work today, tomorrow, and the rest of this special session to find agreement on the things that people of Minnesota want us to find. Thank you, Mr. President. Next on the list is Senator Kent, and then we've had two additions, uh, Senator Kiffmeyer and Senator Rosen. Senator Kent. Mr. President, then I will wait until after the okay. other speakers go. Senator Kiffmeyer. Uh, we'll go to Senator Rosen and then Senator Kiffmeyer. Senator Rosen. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And I will uh, keep this brief, but there has been much talk about trust from Senator Senjum, and I'd like to talk about respect. And I just would like to 
respectfully remind the governor that half the population lives outside of the seven county metro. And it is completely unfair to treat that population the same as what is happening in the seven county metro. And so I implore you, governor, to bring your face mask and come out and visit Senator Eakin's district, Senator Box district, my district, a district that you used to serve, Senator Nelson and Senator Senjim, all the way over to Senator Weber's. We're all different, and you need to realize what our, our families, our business people, our clergymen, our clergy members, our, our young families that are trying to school at home, what they're going through, because they're all different. And again, with all due respect, Governor, I think you have, the, the message is getting diffused, lost in translation, so please come out and start listening to your constituents from the entire state. We have Senator Kiffmeyer followed by Senator Kent. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. President and members. Um, I'm standing in support of this resolution to end the emergency powers of the governor. It's important to realize that Minnesota is one state, but it's not one metro state where half the population, uh, the rules that may work there work in rural Minnesota. Rural Minnesota is more geographically diverse. They naturally physically distance themselves. It's part of rural Minnesota. And so I would hope that Governor Waltz could understand that and realize one size does not fit all as Senator Rosen so graciously has invited, and I do as well, Governor, come out. Come out and see rural Minnesota. Come out and see our communities and understand and see and feel the situation that they are in. It is important for all Minnesotans to feel that they are included. And by the way, in regards to time, this is the first day of the special session. We have other days to work together to analyze each one of those executive orders, many of which we took one today. And there are others that we can. As a matter of fact, Senator Abler has worked on legislation that would codify the emergency orders with time to transition back uh, if, if it comes there. So we right now have time. We have staff. We have chairs of committees who are very competent and very capable. You have leaders amongst you. You have Senator Dietzik. You have Senator Hayden. You have so many here today who are very knowledgeable and willing to work together. And so we are not on the last day of session where we're voting to end emergency powers. We're doing it on the first day so that we have time to put in place that transition that is reasonable and it is thoughtful, but Minnesotans out there, they have really found that the conflicting rules of WHO and CDC, and now you can and now you can't, are very, very concerning uh, to Minnesota. So members, I ask you to support this resolution to the end of the emergency powers and use the balance of our time to make the transition and do those considerations as we move into our opportunity for freedom an opportunity for Minnesotans to choose the level of safety that is most important for them. Thank you, Mr. President and members. Next on the list is Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, we have had a lengthy debate about this question today. Um, uh, lots of opinions being thrown out there, but I want to come back to the fundamental question, because it is a serious issue, a serious constitutional issue that has to do with the separation of powers. We have the executive branch and we have the legislative branch, and the tensions are always there. We know that. Um, there is a very real question about when and how we will, uh, the executive uh, peacetime emergency powers will end. We can sit here and we can pass a resolution and say we're going to end it, but what are the ramifications of that going to be? We've heard a lot of that today. I'm just going to recap a few of the key ones that I think are really important for Minnesotans and everybody in this debate to understand. 
that if the peacetime emergency powers lapse, we would be jeopardizing over $50 million a month in federal funding, have to immediately roll back important modifications and flexibilities that allow critical services such as nursing homes, mental health services, disability services, and child care centers to operate in this world of COVID. In education, the pandemic has taken a deep toll on our schools' budgets, and we've provided flexibilities for fund transfers that allows districts and schools to remain whole, or as whole as possible. Uh, food security for Minnesota's children is essential, and we've directed schools to provide meals for the most vulnerable at this time because it was necessary. We have ensured care for children of critical workers, from health care providers to first responders to grocery workers, so that it's not a barrier for those workers to continue the important work that we need done on the front lines. School employees provided this care every day while prioritizing safe and healthy environments. COVID leave was provided, leave for state employees who contract COVID-19 or are caring for family members who contract COVID-19. And we've talked about the evictions. Evictions and garnishment moratoria would end with the end of the peacetime emergency. In addition, there is an executive order that allows the Department of Veterans Affairs to prevent veterans, uh, excuse me, to prevent visitors to veterans' nursing homes per CDC guidance. And if the peacetime emergency goes away, they would not be able to do that. And we've talked about how vulnerable our seniors are. We need to protect our, our senior veterans. In terms of licensing boards, we've changed, reduced, and postponed various, various licensing requirements for health-related and first responder boards to help those professionals focus on their jobs. Emergency procurement power allows us to quickly procure PPE, other equipment, facilities, et cetera, without following cumbersome uh, state procurement rules. Without the peacetime emergency, we can't do procurement and contracting quickly. This is a critical component to our response efforts, and without this ability, we're back to the normal bid process. The declaration also allows the more effective operation of the State Emergency Operations Center, and the declaration makes a stronger case to FEMA for reimbursement and makes a cleaner process in how we work with them and avoids confusion, all of which benefits the state and the people of Minnesota. So we can have a serious conversation about how to address this. What this sounds like to me is that we've got a, we're at 30,000 feet in a big plane, and we've got the pilot in the cockpit flying the plane, and we want to kick him out, but we're not exactly sure who's going to take over the controls. We're not exactly sure how we're going to fly the plane after we kick him out. Mr. President and members, this pile of papers that I have in my hand are the bills that we are going to supposedly be considering today. This is legislation. Where is the legislation if we really are serious about ending the peacetime authority for the governor? Where's the legislation to take care of that? It looks like we've had time to do some things. Why hasn't the time been invested to say we are ready to step up and take care of these important parts of our state during this critical time of a pandemic and an economic recession and now a major historic civil rights and justice and equities moment? Happy to have that conversation anytime. Happy to participate in that conversation anytime. I know our members are as well. This is a serious conversation about separation of powers, but right now, this is asking to cast a vote without any regards for what the consequences would be. I think it was Senator Friends who pointed out that right now, 49 of 50 states currently have similar powers in place. And the 50th one, our neighbor to the east, I live real close to them, it was done by court order, and they are scrambling as a result because the rug was pulled out of them in this fashion. We need to not do that. We need to work together and keep being responsible and making sure that Minnesotans stay healthy and safe and that we are continuing to uh, address the economic challenges to Minnesotans' lives and livelihoods. This is important. It matters. But we are not ready for this. And so, members, I encourage everyone to vote against this resolution. Thank you. Final discussion on Senate Concurrent Resolution Number 1, as amended, Senator Gazelka. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Members, uh, just the fact that we took an amendment means we're trying to do this right. Uh, but if we're going to be in partnership with the governor, rather than considered out in the stands making comments, which is something that he had said at one time, we have to be equal partners. 
and right now we are not equal partners. So what happens if emergency powers go away? Suddenly the legislative branch is on equal footing with the governor and we can face these problems together. Without facing the problems together, the governor has none of our expertise and he will continue to make decisions that people scratch their head and say, why did you do that? What happened? Where were you? What's going on? And as we followed through this, this COVID problem, again, it has not been as dangerous as people thought it was. It is serious. People do need to follow the CDC guidelines, but they need to live their lives. When you have just a little over 200 people that have died that haven't been in the nursing home, when the governor thought there was going to be 40,000 deaths, tells us that the data that they were using didn't, wasn't correct and led them the, to the wrong conclusions. But we did err on the side of make, taking precautions. I think that was important. We have secured the PPE. We've secure, secured even a place, a morgue we were willing to do that they're not going to need. Uh, we, we did a lot of things to be working in good faith to get to a place just to make sure. But I am sure about we are, where we're at. And will we potentially have hot spots? Yeah, that's possible. Will it be different in the fall? Maybe. Does the governor have the ability to come back with emergency powers? Yes. So as we're looking at this right now, we're saying lift this off. This is the longest emergency peacetime powers ever taken in Minnesota's history. And it's been enough. So let's work together. This is a yes vote. We'll send it over to the House. Let's work together. That's what we're asking with the governor. Not the governor telling us what to do. Not the governor saying, I'm sorry, not the governor saying this is what I'm going to do and have real, no real input, but actually rolling up our sleeves together, working with the governor like we did last year. Far more effective last year in working together. And so Members, this is a green vote. I hope you'll work with us. I hope the House uh, majority also votes for this and we can be on equal footing with the governor. Members, we're on Senate concurrent resolution number one as amended. A roll call vote has been requested. Seeing no further discussion, the secretary will take the roll. Members in the retiring room, in the retiring room, please come to the chamber to vote. Members in room 303, room 303, please make your way down to the chamber to vote. And while they're on their way down, members in the president's office, please come to the chamber to vote.
Members in room 323, room 323, please come to the chamber to vote. And members in room 237, room 237, please come to the chamber to vote. And finally, members in room 206, room 206, please come to the chamber to vote. I'll now call on Senator Kent to report the votes of the members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. President. I report no for Senator Carlson. Senator Carlson votes no. Senator Kent. I report no for Senator Eaton. Senator Eaton votes no. Senator Kent. I report no for Senator Isaacson. Senator Isaacson votes no. Senator Kent. I report no for Senator Klein. Senator Klein votes no. Senator Kent. I report no for Senator Lane. Senator Lane votes no. Senator Kent. I report no for Senator Latz. Senator Latz votes no. Senator Kent. I report no for Senator Newton. Senator Newton votes no. Senator Kent. I report no for Senator Pappas. Senator Pappas votes no. Senator Kent. I report no for Senator Rest. Senator Rest votes no. Senator Kent. I report no for Senator Sparks. Senator Sparks votes no. Senator Kent. I report no for Senator Wickland. Senator Wickland votes no. I'll now call on Senator Jasinski to report the votes of the members voting under Rule 40.7. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Anderson B votes yes. Senator Anderson B votes yes. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Lang votes yes. Senator Lang votes yes. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. That's the final tally of my votes. All members having voted who have the desire to vote, the Secretary will close the roll. There being 38 ayes and 29 nays, the motion prevails and the resolution is adopted. The Secretary will read Senate Resolution Number 3. Uh, where is it? Senator, Senator Gazelka introduces Senate Resolution Number 3, a Senate resolution amending the temporary rules of the Senate. Senate Resolution Number 3 will be referred to the Committee on Rules and Administration. Remaining under motions and resolutions will revert to the second order of business, executive and official communications. The Secretary will read the message. Secretary Ludeman, pursuant to Rule 8.1, all appointments requiring the advice and consent of the Senate were referred to 
that were re refer referred to committees during the meeting of the 91st legislature and not finally acted upon by the Senate are returned to the same committees to which they were previously referred. Any appointments returned to a committee not organized pursuant to Senate Resolution No. 1 are instead referred to the Committee on Rules and Administration. Jeremy R. Miller, President of the Senate. There's no further action on those communications. Remaining under motions and resolutions, we'll move to the third order of business, messages from the House. The Secretary will read the message. Mr. President, I have the honor to inform you that the House of Representatives of the State of Minnesota is now duly organized for the 2020 special session pursuant to law. Patrick D. Murphy, Chief Clerk, House of Representatives. There's no action required on that message. Remaining under motions and resolutions, we'll move to the eighth order of business, introduction and first reading of Senate bills. Members listed in today's introduction calendar are Senate file numbers 1 through 47. The Senate files are given their first reading and referred as indicated. Senator Gazelka. Thank you, Mr. President. I move uh, Senate file numbers 1 through 15, Senate file numbers 26 through 29, and Senate file numbers 44 through 47 be laid on the table. On that motion, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. We will take a brief pause to gather the votes of the members in alternate locations. Receiving a sufficient number of aye votes, the motion prevails. Senator Gazelka. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Members, uh, we're going to recess to the call of the President for about an hour. Uh, uh, Senate Republicans will caucus uh, in uh, MSB 1200. Senator Kent. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, uh, Senate DFLers, we will be caucusing as well via Zoom. Uh, so around 3 o'clock, watch your email for a link. Thank you. Senator Gazelka renews his motion that the Senate recess to the call of the President approximately one hour and ten minutes or so, uh, or approximately one hour. Uh, all those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. Motion prevails. The Senate is in recess. Thank you.